Welcome back inside of Mission Control Houston. Pretty special treat right now. We have former Expedition 29 Commander Mike Fawson with me. Mike, thanks so much for joining me here today. Hey, you bet. It's great to be back in Mission Control. Yeah, we always love having you on. So we have three more astronauts getting ready to launch this Saturday. So why don't you walk us through a little bit about what they're doing, you know, the week before launch. Oh, you bet. It's exciting right now for uh, uh, the uh, uh, Yuri Malenchenko, the uh, Soyuz commander, mm -hmm. Sunny. Uh, uh, Sunita or Sunny Williams and uh, Aki Hoshide, they, uh, they've been in training for about two and a half years. And so it's really a neat time right now as they're, after all of this training, they've been training around the globe, you know, the United mm -hmm. States, Russia, Japan, Canada, Germany, and uh, all over. All over. Yep. And uh, been, been on, uh, for Sunny and Aki, they've been on the road about 50% of the time for the last two and a half years. And, uh, and all of those trainings finally coming together. And they've been in, uh, in Kazakhstan and Baikonur Cosmodrome for uh, about a week and a half. We arrived there two weeks before the launch. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really a, it, it's a it's fascinating time because it's, it's very different. And that, that two and a half years is busy, but in ways it feels, feels like you're, you're, uh, you're, you're just moving or, or you're not really moving. You're not getting mm -hmm. any closer. You're just going through the motions. You're packing your bag. You're going, uh, doing more training and you get closer and closer. And at this point though, as they're, uh, they're in Baikonur going through the final fit checks and final training and you can feel things picking up speed and just your life seems to be accelerating. Oh yeah. As you're, I, I think of it as like floating on a big, long, lazy <laughs> river. <laughs> And that river's dropping into a slot canyon now, and you can feel it. Everything's a little more, a little more frantic, a little busier, and you're going through some of these things uh, for the last time finally, and uh, and so your whole world is picking up speed, and it's going to continue to accelerate for them all the way up to uh, when they head out to the launch pad on Monday. And it's uh, there's a lot of traditions and stuff too, so it's a it's a very exciting time. It's a neat thing. Um, and uh, uh, Sunny and Aki both launched on the space shuttle for, mm -hmm. their, their, for their first flights. And so this is very different for them to uh, be going, you know, to, uh, through the preparations to launch on the Russian Soyuz rocket. And there's all, the, the training, of course, is very different um, as uh, they uh, it, you know, have gone through so many different things. When they get to Baikonur, though, part of what they do is, is um, uh, actual fit checks with the real rocket, mm -hmm. and we, the crews don't, we spend a lot of time in trainers, which are actually flown Soyuz capsules that have been modified to make into trainers, but not our real, our real uh, ship. And so they, a, a couple of times during this two weeks here, they go into their real ship in suits and, uh, and make sure that everything is where they expect it. It gives them a chance to put a little bit of Velcro on the walls, to put their timers up and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, you become uh, accustomed to what it's like to climb down into the ship because the hatch is up above you. It's at the top of the capsule that we, mm -hmm. we launch in. And um, in the trainers, we usually come through a, a, an add-on hatch that's added to the side. Mm -hmm. And so here you practice going, dropping down in there, getting into your seat. And it's really tight, as you can see from the videos that we have. Oh, yeah. It's very tight inside the Soyuz. And the crew is, it's, you know, they're not sitting in a chair. They're really laying on their backs in a, in a seat pan that's been molded to their bodies to help protect them from uh, landing loads and the dynamics of that. So really their first chance to get inside the spacecraft that's going to carry them to orbit. And that, like you said, two years coming to fruition just this last week, moving right. really quickly. That's exactly right. And so it's, uh, it, it's a, a very busy time. It's exciting. Um, and, uh, you know, you go through it and you look at it and, and so, like, just put your hands on everything, touch it, make sure that it's where you expect it, and uh, kind of get comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a way of, of, you know, okay, on launch day then, okay, I've already strapped in a couple of times. I've been in here. We're ready to rock and roll. We're ready for it. Ready for the ride. You're ready, yeah. Okay, well, aside from some of these final tests and the fit checks and things like that, I know there are a lot of ceremonies and different traditions right. that come when you're flying on the, these Russian vehicles. What are some of the things that they're doing this week? Yeah, it's some of the, the, those traditions are, are you know, very different from the, uh, the, from the American side. One of the really neat ones is the, the crew is staying in the quarantine facility that, uh, that we stay in in mm -hmm. uh, Baikonur. Um, it's called the Cosmonaut Hotel. Uh, it's not a classic hotel. Not uh, a five-star resort. No, no, it's cool. not a five-star. It's it's <laughs> definitely a government facility. It's it's nice. It's no problem. Um, but out behind there, this uh, this this facility is uh, kind of a compound. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, fenced and guarded and stuff. Mm -hmm. 
to a, because we, the crew needs to be in a quarantine during that time. Yep. So nobody comes in contact with the crew that hasn't been medically cleared. And we minimize the amount of contact because you don't want to launch just on the verge of getting sick. Yep. It's a, uh, uh, the transition to space is bad enough without adding a cold or something on top of it too and, and sharing it with your crewmates, which everybody would really love. So you're kind of cooped up in this facility, but out behind it, within the compound walls, and you're on the banks of the Sardurya River. It's a, a you know, a very historic uh, place. That it was actually the border of Alexander the Great's domain, oh, wow. right there. And it's uh, this location is also on the Silk Highway for the ancient trade from China to Europe. And so it's it's a very historic kind of location, a little way uh, 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 a post out there. But behind the Cosmonaut Hotel, inside the compound, is a, it's called Cosmonaut Alley or, or Cosmonaut Way. Mm -hmm. And there's trees lining this. The first tree was planted by Yuri Gagarin. Oh, so this and goes so all the way back to the This beginning. goes all the way back 50 years. And so I'm not sure Yuri planted it before he flew, but it was pretty <laughs> close there. And so each crew, before, if you've not yet flown on a Russian rocket, then as part of this final preparation, you go out and plant your tree. And it's such a cool thing to go out and, and walking down these, these path, pathways here is a walk through history as you see the names, you know, of the famous people from space history. And the uh, Apollo Soyuz crew have their names out there too. Uh, they were recognized by the Russians and have, have trees out there. And so it's really a cool thing to, to take part in that, to go out and actually plant your tree and know that uh, on this, in this place is on the edge of the earth. Mm -hmm. It is way out, uh, out there. And there's a there's now a tree with a little signpost on it with my name on it. Wow. As you know, just one of these people that uh, has stood there with these other explorers. And so it's really a uh, kind of a, a really neat tradition to be a part of that and uh, and uh, to walk through and see the, uh, the again the, the Russians and going way back to the Soviet days. And as well as many of the Americans now who have flown with the Russians and other 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 partners from around the globe. So a place really just steeped in tradition. What are what are what are some of the other things that you guys are doing during the week? I know there's a Red Square visit at some well, point. The, yeah, the the a lot of the the other things, uh, the Red Square visit and the Kremlin visit are, take place in the Moscow region before we leave there. Okay. The crew goes through uh, final exams. Uh, they finish those up around three and a half to four weeks before. Okay. Uh, before launch, the big final exams in Russia, and then there's a, a little bit of downtime, week and a half or so, um, where the, you can finish, you're done with exams, you're done with training, and you can school's get your out. stuff packed up. School's <laughs> out, but you, you can't relax too much. Kind of get your things packed up, mm -hmm. take care of, of uh, all the things you need to take care of before leaving the planet for half a year. And uh, included in that is a trip to, uh, to Red Square to uh, lay flowers on the Kremlin wall to recognize the graves of some of the uh, early uh, explorers uh, like Yuri Gagarin and Sergei uh, Korolev, who was the chief rocket designer back mm -hmm. in the day. And uh, it's a neat part of the tradition. And, and as, an, as an American, it was pretty humbling to be part of that and to imagine because, you know, the, the, um, the, you know, my early memories of seeing pictures of Red Square were not in a positive light. Yep. And it was an exotic place, but it was also a scary place, and, and uh, we were at, at odds with each other. And so now for me to actually be walking on Red Square and to be uh, participating in these kind of ceremonies was uh, um, very humbling, uh, hard to, I, it would have been impossible to imagine 20 or so years ago. Oh, yeah. Um, but now, you know, we're doing those kind of things. Um, it, it, now, also in um, in Baikonur during the quarantine time here, I know the crews, uh, uh, Sunny especially, she's a runner, and mm -hmm. I know she's running along the banks of the Sardarya River out there just about every day. I think she's training to do a triathlon during her uh, <laughs> space flight at some well, point. Well, the Summer Olympics are coming up, and so yep. that I, I don't think she's going to run, uh, uh, do a crazy long distance, but... Uh, She's, you know, definitely uh, athletic, and that for me that was a great thing. I really loved running there. You, we could with escort, we can get out and and uh, take a, a jog along the river, and uh, it's a very very different place. Um, you'll have uh, there were times we had to uh, change our route because there were camels, mm -hmm. literally camels, like laying on the trail, <laughs> and it's like okay, don't go too close. You were really kind of out on the edge of nowhere. Yeah, when yeah, you're out it, there. it really feels like it, and that's 
you know, that's kind of a neat feeling. And for me, uh, you know, I like to, to get out and jog too, get out in fresh air and do a lot mm -hmm. of things outside. And knowing that I was going to be inside for you know, half a year, yeah, yeah. I wanted to go out there and soak up a little bit of sun and just to smell the earth and, and that kind of thing. So I know that they're doing those kind of things too. Um, they're doing final uh, some of the training uh, they were doing yesterday uh, uh, there was some rendezvous training, so mm -hmm. they're, they're practicing the manual flying skills, and that's mostly Yuri doing the flying with uh, uh, Sonny and Aki uh, assisting. Yep. Uh, and actually, Sonny is practicing doing some of the flying too. Uh, she's uh, you know able to back him up if if need be, which we don't expect to happen. But you you train for those kind of things, and so. They, uh, they're, they're shown here training on the, uh, on the simulator and these controls, of course, it's not like laying in the Soyuz, but it's, uh, those are the actual controls that they use on the, uh, on the uh, spacecraft and he's looking at a screen that, uh, that shows him a, uh, a, an image like the image he will see through what we call the periscope. Mm -hmm. There's final procedure reviews where you're going through your final books, your, your main Soyuz instructor who's been with you a lot, especially in that last year. And uh, he'll go through, and you're going through every everything you're going to do, and reviewing it one more time, and making sure you understand all the details, and you're ready to ready to go. Uh, training really just does not stop until you are strapped into that spacecraft, ready to go. Let's touch right. on that real quick. Difference between launching on a Soyuz and a shuttle. Well, different sensations. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a very different. For me, the first time I saw the full up Soyuz, because we'd never see him, mm -hmm. uh, was when I was there as a backup crew member. Uh, for Katie Coleman, and the, I, I uh, wow, th that, that's it. That's uh, <laughs> you know, I'm used to the size of a shuttle, uh, which is with the external tank and solid rocket yep. boosters and everything is a really massive, uh, massive rocket. And the the Soyuz is not a big truck. It's a, it's a, it's very efficient at delivering people though. So we, it hauls people and a couple hundred pounds of supplies, mm -hmm. and it's very efficient at that. But it's a lot smaller uh, vehicle, and. Uh, to um, the, what it's like out there, though, it's it's um, it, there's a little bit of difference. One one thing that we'll see on uh, on Saturday, as the uh, the crew's going out it'll, uh, to uh, to their launch, is they'll they'll go through a full suit up and a pressure check of their suits. Mm -hmm. And where in the American program for shuttle flights, that was all done in a suit room with just the technicians and stuff. Yep. And then you do a final walk out and a wave to the crowd and get on the bus and go to the pad. And, in uh, in Kazakhstan, in Baikonur Cosmodrome, we're doing that with the press on the other side of glass. Oh wow! And uh, and our families, and uh, usually some of our guests that come over are allowed to watch this too. So it's really kind of a strange thing to have all of these people watching and observing as you're going through a real pressure check <laughs> of the suit. Uh, their backup crew will be standing right behind them. They're ready to take their place if <laughs> if need be. Uh, and so you know you you go through that and then. Uh, uh, they'll walk out of that building and they'll actually salute into the uh, head of the Russian Space Agency or the space program, depending on who the highest ranking person there uh, might be. And the crew goes out and reports in. And this is the iconic image that we've seen, you know, in history and in and, uh, and all our lives, what mm -hmm. it looks like for the Russians to walk out and salute in like that. And then get on the bus and go for a fairly short ride, you know, to the launch pad. Uh, another thing that that surprised me going out to the launch pad was just the number of people that were out there. Um, there were, uh, you know, quite a few people out there to document it, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of the managers uh, take you all the way out to the rocket itself, and uh, you know, shake your hand and and uh, and uh, you know, wave wave goodbye as you get on the elevator and head up to climb into the rocket. And so I was a little surprised at that yeah. how many people are actually involved. And finally, you get on the elevator. It's a really tiny elevator, <laughs> and uh, you know, and go up to the top, and it's like, okay, now we're now we're alone. It's just us and the uh, very small crew that's helping us strap in and secure the hatches behind us. Uh, as you drop in, uh, you know, kind of a side hatch in the very top part. There's two pieces to the Soyuz that we can get into. The, mm -hmm. the main capsule that we ride up and down in is kind of in the middle of this stack. Yep. The orbit module up above has a side hatch that we go through there into that small by them, and it's about a total of six cubic meters. Um, and then we drop down into the, the uh, descent module, we call it. And uh, so we have the orbit module that's uh, at the very top, and uh, we come through a side hatch in that, and then we drop drop down through a hatch into the middle part, kind of a gumdrop shape uh, 
descent module there, and all three crew members are in the descent module. And uh, you take turns, the two guys on the outside, you know, getting strapped in. And there's a lot of hoses and connectors mm -hmm. to have oxygen line, a ventilation line, communication, uh, and, uh, and a biomedical. So the doctors are actually monitoring heart rate, uh, some basic uh, parameters. And uh, that you do that, you start strapping in a, a little over about two and a half hours prior to launch. Okay. And, and like uh, you said, you're kind of you're you're not sitting up. You're down you're on your, your back. back. You're almost the, kind of the, the seat itself. In there. Yeah, the 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 seat itself is it's, it's a big metal pan that uh, that you know from from your bottom up to the top of your head, and your knees are are up mm -hmm. and actually held by uh, held by straps up into position. And there's the seat right there, and you see that that the liner around it is actually form-fitted. These are just training units we see here, but they're, the, the ones for flight are form-fitted to your body. They actually pour a mold of your body and build it. So it's like a jello mold that's holding your body perfectly. Um, and so at this point, pre-launch, you're getting in and, and you just, you, you just, you fit in that thing with a, you know, just, <laughs> boom, you, 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 and uh, there's no, the, the, the downside is there's very little room to move around. Yeah. By intent, it's designed so it's really tight. You go through the system checks. You check all of the parameters. You check that the handles and and everything, uh, nothing got bumped in the process of getting in. Uh, you have flight procedures that you're kind of uh, looking at and uh, strapping those down and making sure you've got the right pages, kind of earmarked there, uh, little uh, tabs on them so you can find uh, important things, and uh, they'll go through. And then uh, as the uh, the closeout crew is closing hatches behind you, we're activating the systems inside the spacecraft, uh, make sure ventilation, radios, all this uh, carbon dioxide removal systems working mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And uh, then the closeout crew is backing their way out. And, the, and uh, the, the hatch at the top here is the one that we'll, won't, we will not open until after we've attached to the station. Uh, it's a great video of the inside of the, uh, of the orbit module. There's a little more room in here that the silver container has the uh, has uh, you know a few days worth of food and stuff. Uh, this looks like there's a lot of room in the capsule, but there's really not. That uh, that's that little uh, shelf area there is covered, filled up with supplies that are all oh, tied okay. down. So <laughs> it, that was a little surprise when you get into the real one. But anyway, you get strapped in about two and a half hours prior. You go through the system checks and stuff, and then uh, there's extra time added in uh, to the to the schedule in mm -hmm. case. Something needs to be repaired, a communication line's not working or something yep. like that. So they leave a little bit of time, and every once in a while, something comes up and, and you need it, so it's a good thing to do. Um, ours went perfectly fine, so we had time to just sit there and kind of talk a little bit. The ground's talking to us, and, and uh, you spend a little quiet time, too, kind of heading the game and uh, mm -hmm. looking at the procedures again, going through it one more time, thinking, okay, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. and, and um, and uh, making sure I can touch my, uh, you know, controls that I ne was responsible for, um, that kind of stuff. When it's going really well, they have time to play a little music, and yeah. that's that's a, a, a kind of a neat uh, tradition that the Russians have. They actually pump the, some crew choice music out mm -hmm. to the launch pad, as uh, just a way of kind of helping the crew relax a little bit. Do they take requests before you guys they hop in? They do take requests. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's. Uh, that's an, an amazingly in-depth, um, so we know our, our next three crew members are going to be looking forward to doing that. They're, they have all their ceremonies this week, steeped in tradition. Oh, yeah. Sounds like an amazing place. Well, I, I, I missed some of them for the walkout with the, the crews staying in this quarantine facility. Mm -hmm. And when, the, when it's actually time to walk out, yep. um, they sign the door to their rooms. Oh. And so we'll see that Saturday. Uh, there's a, a door signing ceremony, so everybody gets to sign the door to their room, and then <laughs> these doors are getting, when they fill up, I guess they remove the doors to a museum, and they get started, the next crew start with a fresh door. Are they getting um, full yet? And uh, they're, they're getting there. They're getting there? Yeah. <laughs> and, and then you walk out, and there'll be a, uh, a, a Russian Orthodox priest will bless the crew. And, okay. Uh, and uh, that's their part of uh, their tradition. There it involves a, a kind of a liberal application of, uh, of holy water, uh, which is always a little <laughs> bit amusing to watch the crews as they get slightly drenched. <laughs> uh, and from there, it's it's walk out to the. You know, there's a large crowd of people uh, yep. there, and uh, you know waving and 
um, as the crew heads out. So it's all part of the, the traditions that are leading up to it. Um, now once you get you know, into the rocket and it's finally go time, the big difference from a shuttle flight was how quiet it is. The, uh, on a space shuttle, a lot of the dynamics were from the solid rocket boosters that mm -hmm. burn with uh, a lot of popping and crackling and people yep. that were fortunate enough to see one in person, you can actually feel that. Oh, I remember it just kind of hits you like a weight when it when the sound wave gets to you. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it kind of, you know, yeah. it, it pounds on you. You can feel it. Uh, and you can feel that by those, those dynamics coming up through the shuttle stack. Um, and it actually makes it, you know, a little hard to read the uh, displays and controls because everything's mm -hmm. moving for the first two minutes. Uh, for the Soyuz, it's real quiet. It, it, it starts off, and it's a little disconcerting to people that are used to watching the shuttle because the main engines come up, you know, in a few seconds of checking, and then, boom, the, the solids light, and you leap off the pad. Yep. Soyuz moves off the pad more slowly, and the, the engines are running. It's, it's about eight seconds before it starts to move. And so it seems, is, is everything is okay? Is it going? Yeah, is it really <laughs> going? Yeah. And, um, and it's kind of neat because the way the launch pad works is the rocket, it's not really bolted down the way we would bolt, have traditionally bolted ours down. It's held down by the weight. There's these big big pads that are literally push holding the side of the rocket and the weight of the rocket pushes them down and creates the friction that holds yeah. it in place. So the rocket is suspended there. And once the rocket starts to lift off, it releases this and the, uh, it releases the uh, uh, the arms will just spring out of the way then, and so it's a it's a very uh, you know odd looking thing. Um, the um, as the, uh, the the first arms that are coming back, that's just some of the support stuff that includes the elevator and uh, and everything. At this point, the rocket's just held in place uh, by these uh, by these smaller arms that are are uh, literally just held there by the weight of the rocket itself. And you see those down around the base mm -hmm. as the rocket comes to life and starts to light up. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's about eight seconds, and it's a little slow motion here. But it's, uh, the, and, and just watch as the rocket starts to lift off then, then it, those are released. Now they're not bolted on, it's just held there by the, just the mechanics of the, of the weight. Uh, the ride's smooth. Mm -hmm. uh, there's very little vibration in it, uh, very little s really sensation of sound or anything. I mean, you are inside this, the capsule, inside the yep. helmet and everything. But uh, uh, at the, after uh, the, uh, uh, about a minute and a half or so, the, uh, the escape rocket uh, fires off. The, uh, the, the uh, Soyuz has some strap-on boosters, four boosters that are around the base to help it get moving, get off the pad, and get, uh, start to clear the atmosphere, too. And so it's, a, it's multiple stages. This is the end of the second stage uh, here as it falls away. We call it the second stage, and then the, uh, the third stage lights up, and that pushes you to orbit. The whole thing just takes about nine minutes. Really it's quick, a, really quick. You go quick. from sitting still on the ground uh, to going over 17,000 miles an hour, and you are zero G, you know, weightless then, uh, in just nine minutes. And uh, the way we're, we do it now, uh, once the vehicle gets to orbit, of course, the, uh, it has to get activated now. And, and mm -hmm. things like uh, unfurling the solar arrays, which the, the Soyuz uses sunlight to generate electricity. So you unfurl the solar arrays, go through the other system checks. And then there's a couple of burns, typically, to, uh, to circularize the orbit and then to set up the rendezvous. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what they'll be doing is, is setting up the rendezvous for about two days after launch. Almost, it's about 50 hours after launch. The, the crew will be uh, uh, docking to the space station, and so that's a real precise maneuvers to get the orbit fine-tuned. Uh, so after the first few orbits around the Earth after launch, they'll be doing some of those little maneuver corrections. Is and, it a little, uh, little cramped in there for two days, I'd imagine? Well, the, the, it, it, if you were just inside the capsule, it would be almost intolerable because mm -hmm. there's, there's not room to stretch your legs yep. out. It's really tight. Um, once you get to orbit, and uh, take care of the, the maneuvers that you need to do. And mm -hmm. there's some pressure checks to make sure that that orbital module, the top part, is holding pressure. So you go through very careful checks. Yep. Once that all checks out, then you can open up the hatch and get out of your seats and, uh, and get changed out of the suit. So you don't spend the full two days in those suits. Yep. 
and uh, and it's it's yeah it's nice to have a little bit of room to stretch out and then get a bite to eat and your your food your water are up there things like that. And then once you dock, you have more room than you know what to do with oh, once you're on board the station. Oh, it's a big right? difference. You bet. When when you, I mean the, even the 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 two habitable parts of the Soyuz spacecraft have just 10 cubic meters total. Mm -hmm. Before you add seats, instrument panels, and, and all of these systems, takes up and a stuff, lot, which take up uh, half of it. Yep. So there's there's not much volume to work with. Uh, once you get to the station, it's really fun to watch, especially new guys, uh, as they're coming across the hatch because it's like, wow, <laughs> this, you know, in the Soyuz, you can stick out your arms and touch both yep. walls, uh, and uh, you know, there's not you, you're floating, but you're not traveling you're not yeah. flying anywhere you're yeah. you're floating there but you're not really propelling yourself and moving you don't get around. to have fun with it yet you're not having fun with it yet no time for stupid astronaut <laughs> tricks yet <laughs> when you get into the station though it's actually very disorienting at first because it's so big and you're trying to figure out how to move because you haven't had any practice moving and oh so yeah. it's, you watch you, you watch them <laughs> of course none of these none of these uh, guys going up this time are rookies yeah, so they're. I, I guarantee so they're going to be, be up there. They'll be by the time they get. They oh. don't have to crawl before they run. Yeah, no, they'll be. They'll be fine. They'll be a little bit uh, tentative right at first as they're getting their uh, space legs back. It's but like riding a bike, though. It's like riding a bike, though. <laughs> oh yeah. It, All right. Well, we'll certainly be looking forward to that launch coming up this Saturday. Yeah. Expedition 29 Commander Mike Fossum, thanks so much for coming on and give us this great insight into everything that they're going through this week and what they have to look forward to a little bit later. Hey, it's exciting times. I'm really excited for them. It's a long training road, and uh, you know I wish I was there. It's a it's a good time, and I can't wait to watch it. Yeah, well, we'll be following along. Hopefully, we see you up there again sometime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Hold that thought. We'll see. <laughs>